Yes, we are the Fockers behind the veil. There is no Oz, just the Fockers. Um, and it seems kind of ironic because, well, at least Sean and I have been riding our bikes around in the pouring rain for five days. And the second the sun comes out, we've got to be inside. <laughs> That's a ripoff. Anyways, basically, what we are trying to do at Wanderlust is make a complete mockery out of ourselves. Confuse you. But it's mostly that we are trying to create a new kind of festival, one that is participatory and where people aren't just uh, staring at a stage, but you're actually actively involved in the fabric of what's going on. And at the greatest goal, really, is that one would come to Wanderlust and have some form of transformative um, experience and, uh, and at the very least, just have fun. But I think that uh, what we are trying to do, you know, through yoga, but also through hiking and through uh, theater and through burlesque classes and all this kind of different things, is to create a curriculum where people are involved and actually become the event. Um, and I think that's very different than a lot of other events. And I think at the core, we hope that people really feel challenged here, uh, both kind of individually and as a group to confront things and to potentially achieve things that they didn't think that they could do. And that's put, perhaps like in a yoga class, um, uh, but perhaps in, in other ways. So that's one of the things that, you know, this is sort of a loose kind of Q&A kind of thing. I know there's some press people here. But just as one of the uh, goals of the event, that's a main one for us, is that really the event in the end becomes more about you uh, than about us. And, you know, we uh, over the last number of days have had to think a bit on the fly. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, adversity to overcome from a weather perspective and venues have changed. And I think our ops team actually almost had to became sort of the Army Corps of Engineers at one point and had to build a dam and dig a trench and pour concrete and at three and four and five in the morning. Um, so we've had to adjust and, and create and completely in some ways change our plans. Um, and you know, we hope that by overcoming that adversity, we actually create things that potentially weren't expected but then per perhaps are even more special um, because they weren't expected. And I, um, the other night, on the opening night, we had planned to have a kind of opening ceremony by the pond. And this had been something we had been thinking about for five or six months that, you know, we'd put this string quartet by the pond and, and, uh, and we'd all, there'd be this fire hooping performance and, you know, people would light these um, would ostensibly cremate their cares and set their intention by lighting these floating votives and actually launching them into the pond. And we had this vision of like, oh God, this pond is going to look so amazing with 300 votives floating. And of course, you know, it was pouring rain. Um, so it was, you know, plan B, you know, three hours before the, uh, the event, we were like, okay, well, where is this going to go? We saw a chapel over there, uh, and uh, maybe that'll work. So the mountain was kind enough to loan us their chapel, and we, uh, um, with some help, managed to light it up with bliss lights and actually have everyone uh, enjoy an experience uh, in there where they actually got to light their candle and bring it up to the altar and set their intention and lay it there and that became the backdrop for one of the most beautiful performances from a gentleman, a South African musician, Busi Malasela. Um, and I think, you know, it was, an, it was something that for us really became extemporaneous and in a way I think felt more special than the thing that we had been talking about for six months. So just as a personal story, I, we finally closed up the chapel and locked it, unloaded the candles and did all the things and locked it up. And I was kind of feeling sort of a wave of adrenaline at that time and uh, got on my bicycle. And uh, it was dark and it was late and it was wet. And uh, I wanted to 
just zip around and actually we have this crazy house that's just over here uh, that I'd never even been to. Um, so I thought I'd cruise over there and I've spent a, quite a bit of time here so I felt pretty comfortable riding my bike through the dark and, um, and almost, I almost got there uh, and I remembered that there was a path. I mean it was like one o'clock in the morning at this point but I remembered that there was a path going up to this house and there I was careening up the path and then all of a sudden I was flying through the air uh, and actually landed mostly in sort of a heap like a bush and kind of then turned over on my back on some grass and banged my knee and I was sort of lay there on the ground, just really right back here, I'll show you afterwards. Um, and I was sort of like looking up into the sky or into the cloud that I was in and breathing like through my knee trying to actually uh, evacuate the pain and I was breathing and um, finally like the pain started to dissipate and I was actually breathing probably for the first time in a number of hours and uh, and what I realized sort of in a moment of space after like 13 hours of being on my radio um, was that actually I had become sort of a participant in my own wanderlust and I had this moment where I was like wow I actually set out that what I've just done was what I tried to sort of create, what we've tried to sort of create for everyone else, which is challenge myself to create something and then try to overcome adversity and find out something new about myself. And I didn't, and all, you know, I kind of all of a sudden was like lying on the grass alone uh, and it was sort of a, you know, wisdom came in the space that wow, I just now am a sort of part of my own creation from a participant point of view. So it was, uh, it was kind of, a, in the end, sort of a lovely experience. And uh, I am interested to hear kind of everyone's feedback on what they think, how they think we could make this event better, on how, on what ways what things have moved them and how they've challenged themselves and other ways that we could work on creating a festival that is about participation. Um, and then I guess, you know, the other thing that, uh, you know, we've gone through as, um, as a trio is trying to sort of figure out what our core purpose is as an event and in a brand, I guess, but um, and also sort of as individuals and find sort of a commonality between the core purpose of our lives and what we create. And I think that through Wanderlust, what we hope we can deliver to the people that come is an inspiration to do to find, to help to find their core purpose and then to act on it and actually do it and live it. And there is nothing, I think, greater um, than being able to live out your dream and f find your core purpose and then actually be able to devote your time to accomplishing it. Uh, because then you're in that flow and you lose all kind of sense of time and your life becomes about the process and uh, that's a beautiful way to live. And I think by and large uh, we have found that by creating this event in our own lives. And you know it's taken a long time and I think that it will probably change and morph in some ways but for right now um, I think our core purpose is about creating community. Um, that's what we want to do at Wanderlust. And uh, it is, uh, it's, um, it's something that we've all kind of, that has come sort of naturally, I think, to the three of us for a very long time. 
And so, uh, you know, we have known each other for 21, 22 years. Um, Sean, it's crazy because we're only 24. Yeah. <laughs> Sean is, you know, we've been best friends. We all went to college together uh, in New York City. And, and I married this one. Although, as of yesterday, I, I could have married that one. Uh, <laughs> as, because there is uh, now... It's common law. Common law. Yeah. <laughs> but if people don't know, New York State actually, I guess, legalized gay marriage yesterday. And, so. so now it's official, guys. You can yeah, just out exactly. with it. Yeah. <laughs> we have to go back. Vermont was way ahead of it. So, yeah. um, so you know, I think uh, that's all I have to say. So I will yield to our muse, the woman that keeps us honest. I guess that's it. And, uh, it's an impossible mission. but <laughs> can actually, The only one of the three of us that can actually levitate. So. Only physically. Um, I don't have anything to say. Yeah. I'm taking questions. Yeah. I, I have nothing more to say. I have, I have blabbed so much for the last three days. Nobody wants to hear anything I have to say after all of my classes, I don't think. But I will take your questions, and I think, Sean, can I speak for you? Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I can say is that I actually fell off my bike, too. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, I just did it in front of 300 people in a class, and all I felt was embarrassed. But, <laughs> but at any rate, I'll, I'll leave it at that. We can open the floor, so to speak. So to speak. Are there any questions? Because we can probably blather on for some time. If yeah. You, if you would prefer, but. Why is Stratton? Let me first question. Had we known what the weather might be like. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, there's a couple of different answers to that one. I think the, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I think f I grew up in New Hampshire, and uh, so I'm very familiar with this. Jeff's from Connecticut. And, uh, we're both very familiar with this area, but Vermont, I think, really does hold something sort of magical, the, the lushness and just sort of, uh, you know, uh, just grandeur of the natural environment. And I think that nature and really bringing people to a place that is just a beautiful place to spend four days, I think is just one of the very simple things we're trying to do. I mean, I think there's a lot of festivals in the world, and if you sort of look around at the vast majority of them, there's a lot of people there, but where you are is not necessarily in itself beautiful. And I think that, you know, being able to do these events in ski areas and a beautiful place like Vermont is, you know, a huge part of, of, of that. And I guess also Vermont is a very progressive state with a, a lot of other things, qualities to it that I think, you know, really resonate with uh, the type of person who would come to this event, and not to mention there's other things that we tap into, like, uh, Vermont's farm to table and food culture and a lot of other things. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be here. Um, hopefully we'll be here for many more years to come. I'm from Vermont and I work at this mountain and it's one of my favorite places in the world. And I work here in the winter and I just want to say thank you so much for bringing this good energy to this mountain. It's a different place in the winter and to walk around and to see this place with all these people filled with all this good energy, it's like the best thing this mountain can have right now. It makes it, it's such a special place, but it, right now it's, it's got a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Alex Grant, I'm uh, from Australia. I've felt a lot of connection with you guys, even though we've never met. Um, I want to thank you for putting this on. Um, also, I want to talk about the community aspect, how you kind of grow that um, beyond the festival, because everyone kind of, you know, comes here and then goes back to their homes, and uh, how do you find a way to bring that together and maintain it, you know, outside the gathering? Uh, is there something that you kind of, I mean, I see you do a lot of events, and maybe something. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, what's different with this event versus a, like, Lollapalooza or, you know, big music festival is that, you know, people take this, what happens here, um, and it's become, it's, it's been woven into the fabric of their life. You know, it's like, you don't just come here and, and take a bunch of yoga and then go home and, and don't 
take yoga, or is people aren't coming here and just discovering organic food and then and then going home and eating hot dogs, you know, or whatever. It's just that's you know, wanderlust is based. Uh, it's it's formed around a culture and a lifestyle. So you know, and that life that's that's 365 days a year. Um, so I mean. You know, in terms of what we can do, I mean, certainly we do do a lot of events. Um, we're doing them all over the country. We hope to do them all over the world, even in your country. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly from like a day to day perspective, you know, we want to try to engage people in the ideas uh, around mindful living. And, you know, the most obvious way to do that is through social media. And that's what we have done thus far. Um, but I think it's just a beginning. I mean, we have talked about concepts of, you know, of quasi, you know, membership. It would never be called that. But a way that people can actually become part of a wanderlust network in a community um, where people begin to meet each other and exchange ideas that have nothing to do with us or anyone that works for us. It's actually just a place where community gathers. Um, and I think that that would be... A, a noble goal. Uh, and it's starting to happen, I feel, you know, just in a very organic way. I think people, you know, I get a lot of anecdotal feedback of people that just met through us or through being here and then started a business together or now go to the same yoga studio or um, actually even uh, got married and actually. One, I, I know of at least two babies conceived at Wanderlust. <laughs> so that's one very literal way to grow the community. Uh, but people, people very uh, often tell me that they, uh, I mean, you know, obviously Facebook is so huge in everyone's life, but immediately after this event, most people go home and they have like anywhere from 10 to 1,000 new friends. And then when, and I've had so many people say, yeah, it's so awesome. And then I, you know, I travel to London and I just like ask all the people that I met on Facebook, like, where should I go? And then I hook up with people that maybe I didn't even meet at the festival, but it's just, you know, it, they tell me where I should go practice or where I should go to eat. And, and then sometimes I meet up with people and they're like, they were at Wanderlust too. So, you know, I th it just, it has a, it has a natural outgrowth to the social media that's already out there. Very simply, I sometimes think about that is that you can't create community, community creates itself, but you create the conditions for community to come together. And I think that that's, you know, sort of what happens here. And so people take that home with them and they continue to connect in whatever way they do that, but it's really providing a gathering point, which is really sort of how I see the event. It's a gathering place for people with certain, I'm well, not going to say the same, but certain similar values and similar, similar goals and that goes home with them and they come together here and meet new people that are like them. So. And I would also just to, to sort of build on that, <clears throat> one of, one of our, our real inspirations was in not just bringing together the yoga community to have an awesome time together because that happens a lot anyway, but to widen the net so that there is a music platform and there is, you know, there are increasingly more and more, there's all the people who came just to hear Deepak speak. And, you know, there's people that hopefully will come just to like check out the food and people who come just to walk through the village and check it out and it's free, you know, you just come and see what's going on. And it's, it's been really satisfying to see what's happened over the last three years in Tahoe because I meet people, you know, I met so many people last year who, you know, we'll, we'll say, we'll tell some story about, oh yeah, you know, I came to here, blah, blah, the first year, and I looked around, and I was like, who are all these crazy people? And then I thought maybe I'd come take a class, just one this year, and it was so awesome, you know? So it is a, it, it is like, you know, it's a gateway drug. <laughs> all the, the, the other stuff that, that we do, this, the sort of main, more mainstream things, bring, bring more and more people in, and, and I think it's, it's a, awesome for the larger community to, to be brought in in a in a kind of a very friendly, accessible way, and and then they they have um, access to the wider experience. Yeah. Hi. It's hi. such a pleasure to be here. Um, Skylar, I'm Diane from Where Is My Guru. Oh, you, hi, you Diane. You gave us this amazing interview before the festivals. Underserved communities. I know that we talked a lot this week. Some of my guests on the show talked about bringing yoga 
to people that just can't afford it. And so this model of a festival, I think, is such a brilliant inspiration. And I see so much growth potential in that building this community that we talk about. And I was just wondering if you have anything to, to say or contribute about yoga for underserved or getting yoga to those kinds of communities. Well, one thing that we've actually discussed this year, and I can, I know will happen next year, is uh, we, we do have in develop right now a sort of scholarship program that we're going to launch for next year, um, which is geared at exactly that. I mean, you know, we know that we know that it's not necessarily cheap to come here and stay in a hotel and to do all of that. So, you know, we have a lot of measures of that nature, but we want to start a scholarship program, which you know will hopefully open the access to a, to a much wider group of folks. And then, you know, some of the other things that relate to that are just making it easier to get here and stay here. So camping, coming along, <laughs> we're definitely going to have that going next year. Um, hopefully it won't rain the whole time. <laughs> uh, uh, you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the scholarship piece I think is very important. Um, I mean, I think that obviously the yoga community suffers from a lot of homogeneity sometimes. And uh, I think, you know, it would be nice to see a greater diversity and variety uh, kind of within, I guess, the demographic of, of yoga. Um, but yeah, it's, it's in some ways it is a sort of a self-selecting and self-perpetuating community. Um, and you know, hopefully, you know there will be you know ways to come. And we have a very robust sort of volunteer program, but and a lot of people come. I mean, I think we have two hundred and yeah, over two hundred, two hundred fifty something. Two hundred fifty like volunteers um, here now, but that doesn't really address. I mean, those people may not be able to kind of afford to buy the Sage Pass or something, uh, but that doesn't really address perhaps kind of what you're maybe getting out a little bit, which is actually getting in, getting people to come here from communities that don't actually have the values of the yoga community. They don't, it's just, you know, where we live, there's like a million yoga studios. We are like, including all the ones Skylar owns. <laughs> but uh, like, and you walk out our door and it's like, oh, you know, you know, organic, everything and free range this it's just very accessible to us um, and that's even in Brooklyn but um, but there's places where that just doesn't exist and it, I think that that is a challenge for us uh, to reach out into communities and try to bring people into this experience and then hopefully they can go back into those communities and spread the value system but it's something we've definitely talked a lot about and I thank you for asking. It's one of the question. reasons that Off the Mat is is our charity, because that's their really the, their core mission is to create you know <coughs> wider and wider webs of people who are going out and creating leaders in in all communities and in all parts of the world. So you know in a in a very basic way, that's how one way that we help to to just fund that kind of community networking. But it would be nice to have programs that were, were very directly related to the festival itself. Yeah, we've, uh, we've been working on that for some time. Uh, you know, this year was actually the first year we were able to bring in a, uh, a greening consultant, a uh, company called uh, Zero Hero out of, uh, out of Colorado. Um, and, you know, really what we've learned over the years, I mean, you know, like I would say most festivals, I mean, we have a recycling program, we have a composting program where, you know, using biodiesel, we are using compostable flatware and cups. I mean, you can go down a list of things and I think a lot of festivals do those things and it's commendable and we certainly do them too. Uh, but I think one of the areas we've been trying to get better at is uh, actually implementation and, you know, uh, one of the things that's very hard about greening at a mass level is that you can do the right things, but the question is, do the, do the compostable forks actually end up being composted and turned back into dirt, or do they end up in the landfill where they're, they actually don't technically uh, decompose? You know, they have to be treated in a certain way. And I mean, you know, there's a lot of things like that from 
uh, you know, and so by hiring this this company and working with this company, Zero Hero, um, you know, I think that's greatly improved what we've been able to do. And you know, I'm sure there's a lot more we can do going down into the future. But but you know, for now, that's really been the focus is sort of taking the things we're doing and just trying to get really better at making sure they actually happen after everyone's gone home. That you can feel sure that your bottles are actually being recycled. You know, so I, I think the other piece of that is just. Consciousness raising. Yeah. I mean, that's what we do here, and you know, we're growing a lecture series every year. It becomes a bigger pillar of the event, and bringing in people uh, that can inspire the you know eco leaders of tomorrow. Um, you know, working with vendors and with local. Uh, you know, we have a, a number of local uh, farms and uh, from the West River Farmers Market that are part of. Our vending area. Uh, we have a whole farm to table dinner that's happening just tonight. So I think that you know we're very unique in that way, not in just terms of you know the resources that we spend towards trying to actually green the event, but also what actually happens at the event, and uh, and that's very much part of like obviously the culture that that we're living in. But I mean I think at the same time it's like we need to be honest with ourselves and with people, and while we are trying to limit our footprint in every way we this is a destination event so people need to get here so they burn fossil fuel coming here they fly from all over the world um, and you know we need to be honest about the fact that you know it's like going to be very very hard for us to ever be a zero impact event but I think we can continue to do whatever we can to try to get there um, and at the same time try to have a long tail uh, with the people that come here um, to go back and live a more conscious and green life just in their everyday life. To follow up that, I, I promised my friend Chrissy that I would give her suggestion. She can't be here, she's in another session. She said, everyone should have to get a SIG bottle with the one of those logo as part of their ticket price, and then they won't be any recycling. <laughs> like, so I'm just sharing that because I promised her that I would. Yeah, it's we actually, almost got it. We were very close. It wasn't quite that, but uh, we were working with uh, Clean Canteen for a. Uh, they have a new program which we just couldn't quite get done, but it's uh, it's actually really cool. It's a it's a festival cup program where they give you instead of your normal beer cups. For this is sort of more for the main stage kind of events where thousands of people show up, and then instead of a plastic cup or a compostable cup as we're using, they give you you buy with your first beer or your first beverage a stainless steel cup at a very cheap price and then you keep that with you the whole weekend they wash it for you they sort of redo it and that becomes so there's like by the end there's nothing so you know uh unfortunately they just started that we couldn't get it done for this but we're, Actually, we're moving we could, maybe we could focus group you yeah. who would if you had to buy a beer for uh, your first beer at the main stage for like 10 or 11 bucks and then every subsequent beer was like five bucks and then, you know, would A, would you do that? Uh, and you would get this beautiful piece of Wanderlust memorabilia at the same time. <laughs> it uh, is high quality It is very high steel. quality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it also clips onto your belt buckle. So you'd be dancing on to Michael Franti, yeah. sort of nudging up to yeah. your partner yeah. uh, with your <laughs> with your clean canteen yeah. cup. So you know, Looking I just wonder like if that for sure, if that's yeah. an experience that people would want to live with in the name of environmentalism. So I ask all of you, who would do that? It, the yeah. festival cup does not have a top. There, uh, well, you you drink it, it yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could clip it on before you emptied it, but it's not, it's not, not recommended. So. I'd be more interested to know if you wouldn't buy it because you were just put off by the 10 or $11 price tag on your first or the purchase. Or, or the, the inconvenience. inconvenience. Raise a hand. Yeah, one, two, three. Wouldn't, wouldn't buy it, wouldn't, raise your you hand. You wouldn't do it because you're like, that is a rip off, forget it's a hassle. Or it's a hassle. I would have a suggestion, have a portion of the proceeds go to a nonprofit that there's well, no there, there are no proceeds. We sell them at cost. Oh, cost. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's <laughs> no the no the beer proceeds. You mean yeah? Well, no, the beer proceeds are the same, but the cup we'd give you at cost. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. We'd have to message that. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> We're telling you now. We're giving you the cup at cost, <laughs> which we are. All right. All right. Back. 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 Yeah. Back to you. Um, what is the main thing you want your attendees? 
to obtain from this experience? And secondly, how do you manage to be so interpersonal with your attendees here at this event where you have so much going on? Well, first of all, I'm glad you made it. Because you interviewed me once, right? Yes. Yeah. And you weren't sure you were going to make it. So I'm glad you did. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll defer. Really? Um, That's such a good question. I <laughs> made for you that question. I'll, the first I'll answer it. Um, and then you can pipe in. Um, I guess I would say to, the, to your first question, I think that the, the primary thing, the, or the immediate thing that I think, I hope, and this is just my personal perspective that people get from it, is joy, like pleasure. And not in a hedonistic sense, though there might be some of that, but in just like a expansive, whole body way. And then I think that, like from, from joy and pleasure comes inspiration. And you know, we're, not, we're rarely inspired just from the head, or from what we think we should do or would like to want to do. But when you're actually blown open a little bit, that's and that you, when you have a really good feeling about something, your heart is open, as we say, then inspiration to you know, do stuff, do good stuff, or be a better mom, or you know, open that business with your friend, and, or whatever it might be, big and small. That's where that comes in, and um, <clears throat> I feel like a lot of times the the spiritual path or the conscious living path can be heavy and pretty dogmatic and there's a lot of like oh shoulds and it's and it's not that that it there isn't rigor and discipline involved and anybody who who has any kind of a practice knows that but the important thing and the thing that's going to keep you going and and inspired is you know is the good feeling so i guess that's 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 where we're, i feel like yeah. we're coming I from i mean i think you know we had to sort of buckle down when we were sitting in our production office Wednesday or Thursday, Wednesday night, and we were looking at, you know, three or four days of sheets of rain on the forecast. You know, it was important to kind of remind ourselves that, that this gathering is not about any one teacher or any one band or lecturer, the success will not be measured there. It will be measured by the connection that people make amongst each other. And, you know, in some ways, the rain and what's happened the last couple of days is a blessing because I think in some ways it's helped to create those connections. Um, you know, it's like more than once we've had to invoke uh, you know, Woodstock, <laughs> uh, because, you know, that really, it's the most legendary, renowned festival, but, but there's a reason for that. It wasn't just that there was half a million people. It was because people developed a connection there amongst each other that was so powerful that it's actually lasted now 40, 50 years, 40 years. Um, so I think that that's the key, you know? People go home feeling connected. And in some ways, sometimes it's easier to do that with the weather that we've had for the last few days because people started kind of clustering up, talking. And sort of to answer the second part of your question related to that, I mean, when you have adversity, uh, it also affects us internally and, you know, it really brings our team together. And I think that that's one of the sort of amazing things. I mean, we, we sort of do most of what we do with about eight people many of whom are actually sitting in the back of the room and deserve a round of applause <laughs> um, for, uh, for most of the year. And then when it comes to festival time, we get, you know, it swells to 100 people working for us, 250 volunteers. So all of a sudden there's a massive group of people here. And, you know, the reason why we have time to sit here and talk to you is because all of those people are so incredible at what they do and really are so devoted to creating a, a great experience, you know, so that, you know, when you have things like this happen with, you know, flooding venues and God knows what, you know, it's, uh, it's great to have a team to rely on and we've all, you know, I think got a lot closer because of it. And to your yeah. second question, I'm in the very lucky position of being able to teach class. So I get to, you know, these guys are out busting ass, <laughs> like making it happen and I get to kind of 
be in the luxurious position of, of teaching, which is really, it's the icing on the cake, you know, as far as jobs go. Um, and so I get to, you know, just see what is actually going on inside the walls. And I, and it, I was able also, in, which was very nice to be able to tell everyone who was on the production side, like, nobody minds really. I mean, yeah, of course, you'd, you'd wish that you were, it was dry and we were frolicking on the lawn in between classes. But inside the classroom, everybody's having such an amazing time that, you know, the reality check, it's really easy to get stuck on the production side in like what's not going right or how, you know, there's such was, there was a lot of mayhem. But actually on the, uh, from, from class to class, it was the, experience was so incredible and that was it was great to be able to see that firsthand yeah. and report back. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, you guys talk a lot about um, trying to inspire, trying to um, cultivate an environment that really is, but, um, inspires other people. So I guess my question is what inspired you to actually do this and what, how did this all come together? I'd really love to hear kind of how it all went together. Well, we have remarkably, in incredibly compatible skill sets between the three of us. That's actually sort of blessing, although it also makes us hate each other at times. Uh, we all see a sort of a different angle on the same thing, which is, um, but it's still the same thing, which is nice. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, Sean and I, not to get too much history involved, but we, we've, Sean and I have been business partners for a very long time, for 12 years. We, Sean is a lawyer, I am not. And, <laughs> uh, and you know, we started a, a, a music company um, 12 years ago that was a record label and a music and artist management company. We've overseen the development of a lot of careers. We put a lot of tours out on the road. We've been very close to the development of big festivals all over the place. Um, and so we've just been very much in that side of the world, very kind of uh, we're paying a lot of attention to sort of look and feel and marketing and design and, you know, really, and business, really. And at the same time, Skyler opened a yoga studio upstairs from our office. He was my lawyer. Yeah, still is. Because I made him do it for free or something. <laughs> she started Kula Yoga Project in Tribeca, and that studio grew uh, and has grown a lot. And then recently, she opened another studio in Brooklyn. But kind of through that process, uh, as you know, Sean and I were developing like widgets to try to convince people to like buy a 99 cent track and not steal it and like, you know, the kind of perils of the music business. Um, you know, Skyler's business was, was growing and we were fortunate enough on our coattails to go to a lot of retreats in Costa Rica and, you know, just become very in touch with that community. And I think what we found was that, um, you know, we, Sean and I both sort of grew up kind of politically oriented and kind of socially progressive and that, that the values, um, the moral and kind of social values of the yoga community felt very, something very familiar to us. Um, but the production and marketing values of the yoga business, of the yoga world left something sort of to be desired and I think still does. So I think we kind of were able to kind of bring a kind of higher level of kind of strategy and marketing and design and, and vision, vision, I think, really. You know, in, and sort of combine those values with the yoga community values to create something um, together. And also, I mean, what a great life, you know, to work with your wife and your best friend. So. <laughs> but I also feel like, you know, the, the, I feel like there's something to be said for some one or some pe two people coming from the outside and having a connection but also being able to see the larger picture because they're not in you know in the soup and when when the the idea really was Jeff's to begin with and when he sort of floated it I was like oh my god that sounds like so much work and 1200 people at a yoga retreat festival that's crazy and it wasn't crazy I mean it was actually a incredible idea and as these guys you know sort of developed in and then we you know we we started to really 
put it together. I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, you, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. And, um, and, and they, they really had, the, like, the umbrella vision, which, which I wasn't even able to see at the, at the outset. Yeah. I think we should probably wrap it up for sake of time. But, um, you know, we like to make ourselves incredibly available as much as we can. Um, so, and we want feedback, we want ideas uh, um, all the time. So please feel free to come and talk to us um, at any time, either just walking around or after this session. And um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you.